My wife's been shot and there's a guy in my house and I shot him. Oh, she don't have a pulse. Boom, boom. Boom. Thomas Randolph was sentenced to death for the 2008 murder of his wife, Sharon. Boom! Boom! He was dubbed the Black Widower after four of his six wives ended up dead. You did have six wives and four of those six wives are dead. That's true. And the gun went off and put, uh, was in not very far away from me. Well, you're not supposed to hold anything against me because you're fair. You're, 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 you're a big judge. Boom! Boom! But with his conviction recently reversed and a new trial pending, could this alleged wife killer eventually walk free? Who's going to say I did what? Boom! 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 After a date night at the movies, Thomas Randolph and his wife Sharon were making their way home. As they approached the house, Sharon got out and went in ahead of Tom, who was parking the car in the garage. Minutes later, when he accessed the home from the garage door and turned on the light in the hallway, he encountered a horrific scene. His wife was on the floor, and blood was coming out of what looked like a gunshot wound to her head. Thomas ran to the phone to call 911 but the line was dead. That's when he saw him, an intruder, the man who had just shot his wife. Since he had guns in the house, he conveniently located one near him and chased the intruder, shooting away all the way down the hall. He managed to shoot him down as he tried to get out through the garage. After that, he was finally able to get through 911 and called for help, attempting to keep Sharon alive with the help of the dispatcher. But it was already too late and by the time emergency services got there, Sharon had passed away. This heroic story was told by Tom Randolph himself after investigators questioned him that same night. The 52-year-old had just witnessed the death of two people, the intruder and his 47-year-old wife, but somehow Thomas was able to give so much detail to his story it was astonishing. However, the story wasn't making that much sense so investigators brought him back to the crime scene to retrace his steps and reconstruct the events of that night. We're doing a walkthrough of the house, kind of a reenactment of what happened uh, last Thursday. Just coming on in the house. Then I turned the light on myself as we got in. I get right here and Sharon's laying in the floor, face down. I stopped right about here, had the door. I said, Sharon! Sharon! And I dialed 911 and the phone didn't work. I remember saying, I thought I just seemed like a shadow or something over this. Boom, boom, boom! I don't know how many times I shot him, but I just, just kept right on going. Boom, boom, boom! And I mean, I actually got close. Boom, boom! And I don't know if I shot him once, I shot him twice, and that's when Whoever said 911. My wife's been shot, and there's a guy in my house, and I shot him. Has he. Is, is, is he, he hurt fight? too? Uh huh. Is he hurt too? I hope she's dead. Oh, <laughs> She don't have a pulse. Sure. Oh, God. Sure, come oh, back God. to the phone. Oh, I can't get her over. Okay, I'm gonna try again. We gotta try to do CPR. I need you to try. <laughs> And I know the whole time I'm I'm probably crying and yelling, Sharon, Sharon, talk to me, something like that. That whole retelling was captured on camera by the police, and the chaotic way of reconstructing the story, as well as his stone-cold face while focusing on the terrible details of the night his wife was murdered, were enough to make investigators raise an eyebrow. From the first moment they heard the story, police suspected Tom wasn't telling the whole truth. But after this retelling of the events, it was more than obvious. The evidence collected at the scene and the recording of the 911 call poked holes into his story. There were no bullet casings recovered from the hole where he had allegedly started shooting the intruder, and the location of the blood didn't match the position of both Sharon or the intruder with the story. 
the 911 call was also confusing. The dispatcher had to insist several times that Thomas had to perform CPR on his wife to try and resuscitate her until the ambulance got there, but he kept getting distracted and moving away from the phone. Sir, oh, God. Sir come back to the phone! Oh. It almost seemed like he was stalling the help his wife needed. But perhaps the detail that most gave him away was something else he said in the 911 call. At one point, talking about the intruder, he mentions he actually knows who this man is. I know him. He's ripped me off. He's tried to rip me off. These inconsistencies were enough for investigators to believe Tom's story was far from the truth and began pulling the threads to unravel this bizarre case. The intruder's identity was soon revealed. Michael Miller was a 38-year-old man Tom knew very well. According to him, he had met Michael a few months prior. He didn't have much money, so out of the kindness of his heart, he had given him handyman work to do around the house, so Michael had been in Tom and Sharon's home many times. But people began to notice the two were spending a lot of time together. They would go out shooting, doing target practice, and would sometimes have private conversations and whisper in other rooms. In fact, in the two months before May 8th alone, they exchanged over 300 phone calls. This detail was incredibly suspicious to investigators. Why would someone so close to Tom break into his house and kill his wife? What was the motive? Tom claims he would lend money to Michael in exchange for work around the house, but Michael would sometimes spend it at the casino. He was determined to make investigators believe Michael had broken into their house to steal from them. However, investigators were about to discover the real motive behind Sharon's death, and it definitely had to do with money. In the months before Sharon was shot in her own home, Tom had taken out at least four life insurance policies on her. This meant that in the event of Sharon's death, Tom would receive $360,000. Detectives started putting the pieces together and came up with a theory. Tom had hired Michael as a hitman to kill his wife and get the insurance, but to make sure he left no ends untied, he'd killed Michael, making it seem like a burglary gone wrong. It looked like they had the story figured out, but then they dug a little deeper into Tom's past, and what they discovered was a lot to unpack. Sharon was Tom's sixth wife, but she was also the fourth one to die. Before living in Nevada, Tom Randolph lived in Utah. This is where he met his first wife, Catherine, who claims Tom was unfaithful to her many times. He had a lot of extracurricular activities, um, namely other women. She also claims he was abusive and even threatened to kill her. After a rocky marriage, they decided to get divorced, and the day after the divorce papers were signed, Tom married his second wife, Becky. According to Catherine, Becky's marriage with Tom was no different to hers. Becky even seeked her help at one point, claiming Tom was being abusive towards her and admitting she was scared of being with him. Catherine advised her to leave him, but she never did. In 1986, Becky was found dead in her own bed at home. She had a single gunshot to her head. The death was initially suspected to be a suicide, especially after Tom told the police Becky was battling depression and drug addiction, and she had attempted to take her own life before. The police believed him at first, until a witness came forward and told them otherwise. Eric Tarantino revealed that Tom had tried to hire him to kill Becky. In fact, he'd been very persistent and openly discussed to end her life. With his wife gone, Tom was about to receive $500,000 from the life insurance he'd taken out on Becky in their three years of marriage. This completely changed the case, and Tom was arrested for the murder of his second wife, Becky, in 1986. While he was in custody, Tom conspired to kill Eric and discussed it with a fellow inmate. He was also charged for this, for which he pleaded guilty. However, in the murder of Becky, there was no evidence to support that he was the one who'd killed her, so he was eventually acquitted. He was free to go. Soon after, Tom was ready to find love again. After posting a newspaper ad, he met Gaina. The two were married soon after meeting, 
but their marriage, just like the two before, was not easy. Apart from being abusive towards her, Gaina was convinced he was trying to kill her. One day, Tom was cleaning his gun in front of her when it suddenly discharged. Supposedly, I was told the gun was... There was no bullets in the gun. That's what the defendant had told you? Yes, and that he was cleaning the gun at the dining room table. And the gun went off and put a within not very far away from me, I put a hole in the kitchen floor. Would it be fair to say that the hole was inches away from you? Yes, but I, mean, I could see the smoke actually coming up out of the floor. She wasn't hurt, but she couldn't shake the feeling that it hadn't been an accident at all. Their marriage wouldn't last much longer, and Gaina divorced Tom before he could seriously harm her. So Tom went off to marry again, for the fourth time. In April of 2004, Frances, Tom's fourth wife, had to undergo heart surgery. It wasn't an easy procedure, but everything went according to the doctor's plans, and Frances was recovering well. Her daughter was with her in the room visiting until Tom arrived and told her to leave and take a break. When she got back a few hours later, her mother was dead. Tom told her there had been complications from the surgery and she'd passed away suddenly. Frances' daughter was in shock, but had no time to process what happened, since Tom had Frances cremated within 24 hours and he didn't allow an autopsy to be performed. And once again, he was on the way to collect a hefty life insurance check. Not much is known about his fifth wife, Leona. However, she too mysteriously passed away after a short marriage. Tom told family and friends Leona had cancer, and she'd lost her battle against it. And that brings us to Tom's sixth wife, Sharon, who had been shot at her own home and was going to make Tom over $300,000 richer. Investigators were shocked to find this incredible history of fatal accidents that kept making Tom a widower. However, he wasn't a sad one, since every time he cashed the insurance check, he'd move on to his next conquest. All this information was more than enough to build a case against him and charge him with the death of his wife and the man he allegedly hired to kill her. Thomas Randolph was arrested in 2008 after a long investigation into the murder of Sharon and Michael and the inconsistencies between the evidence and his story. However, it would take nine years before his first court appearance. In 2017, an unrecognizable Tom appeared in court wearing his long white hair and two pigtails. His attitude was not well received. He proceeded to mock the judge and accuse the prosecutor of corruption, something unbelievable for a man who was potentially facing a death sentence. When I talked to the other attorneys, they said, oh, you're gonna just piss her off. You're gonna make her look, make her look stupid, make her look silly, whatever. And, and she's just gonna hold it against you. Well, you're not supposed to hold anything against me because you're fair, you're, 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 you're a good judge. Tom insisted he was innocent, and was very sure he wasn't going to be found guilty. He was already tried once for killing one of his wives, and he was acquitted, so he was convinced things were going to go the same way this time around. However, this time, the evidence did tell its own story, and it had very little to do with what Tom told detectives in his walkthrough of the scene in 2008. In his video, he says he started shooting Michael in the hallway, but no casings or blood were found there. Michael's gunshot wounds proved he'd been shot from above, and suggesting he was already on the garage floor when he was shot. The alleged ski mask Michael was wearing was found next to the body, but the plastic tag was still on, and barely any of Michael's DNA was on it, even though he'd been shot in the head. The video of him retelling the story of what happened on May 8, 2008, was used against him to point out all of the contradictions between his story and the evidence. Tom's troubled love life was also brought to the stand. His two surviving ex-wives, as well as family of the deceased ones, testified against him, insisting he was abusive, he was only interested in money, and had even tried to hire other men to kill them. After the jury had heard all sides of this twisted story, they were ready to make a decision. When Tom returned to court to hear his sentence, his appearance and attitude had changed. He cut his hair, he kept quiet, and he listened carefully to what the jury and the judge had to say. During the above entitled case, having found the defendant, Thomas William Randolph, guilty of count two, 
murder of the first degree with the use of a deadly weapon, Sharon Cause Randolph, imposed a sentence of death. Thomas Randolph was found guilty of murder with the use of a deadly weapon for Michael's death and conspiracy to murder his sixth wife, Sharon. He was sentenced to death. After being sent to death row in 2017, Thomas Randall's attorneys immediately appealed the case, and surprisingly, in December of 2020, his death sentence was reversed. The judge ruled that the prosecution shouldn't have been allowed to include information about the murder of Becky in 1986, since in that case, Tom had been acquitted. Therefore, Thomas Randolph will get a new trial, in which he already has claimed he will defend his innocence once again. So it seems this bizarre case is still not closed. This is definitely one to watch out for, to see how the new trial unfolds, and to know if justice will finally be served for Sharon, Becky, or any of their victims.